Amen. Will you stand? And as we worship together, as we begin this morning, will you just think about the fact that we are in the presence of the Lord and that the Lord wants to move among his people this morning. So just pray as we begin and as Sonia leads us and ask the Lord, what does he want to do in your heart this morning? It's not just another morning. The Lord wants to do something in your life and in my life. Let's sing as Sonia leads us. Jesus is in this room, here right now, here right now, making this place I stand, holy ground, holy
morning, church family. I'm so excited to be here in the baptistry this morning, baptizing three young people. Each one of them have repented of their sins. They believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead to save them, and they have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This first young man is Mr. Jackson Bryant, and I've known his dad for quite a few years, and I am so excited for him. About three weeks ago at home with his dad, he gave his life to Jesus. And Jackson, it is because, that's right, it is because of that decision that you made that it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism unto death and raised to walk in newness of life. All right, Jackson. And this is my friend, Collins Berry. She is so cute, and she is so excited to be here this morning. <laughs> About two years ago, in her bedroom with her mom, she gave her life to Jesus. And so, Collins, it's because of that decision that you made to give your life to Jesus that I can baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism unto death, and raised to walk in newness of life. Great job. And this is my new friend, Anna Rogers. About six weeks ago, Anna made a decision to turn her life around. She entered the Mariah House and in turn started coming to Bellevue Baptist Church. And through that, she has given her life to Jesus. She told me this morning she wants a better life for her and her newborn child. And so, Anna, it is because of that decision that you made, I can baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism unto death, and raised to walk in newness of life. All right, stay right here. Stay right here. And church family, all God's people said? Amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. It's great to see those young people baptized. Now, there's two categories, young people and old people you got to decide which category you're in. Hey, let me thank you. Today is a special day. You know, today we end our year in giving, uh, our budget year. I just want to thank you for your faithfulness uh, to the budget of the church and your tithes and your offerings. We don't take a formal offering. You can give that out in the lobby in the receptacles that are there. But uh, thank you for your faithfulness. We were able to make budget in an unusual year. And it's because of the great people and the great obedience that we have that are seated out here. So thank you for that. It has allowed us to continue to be on mission. I got this email yesterday, and I wanted a chance to share it with you because next week's Easter. But, you know, we had four weekends of Bellevue Loves Memphis. And I just want to, this is just a few things that we've been able to continue uh, as a result of those past four weeks. We, we gave 10,700 gifts of encouragement to our health care workers. Uh, yeah, we had, we had right at, we had 599 people. I don't know why they couldn't find one more, but anyway, uh, we had 599 volunteers. We fed 1,400 families through food distribution, okay? And then we had 56 professions of faith over the four weekends. So, you know, we give God the praise. I know last week our Christian Dental Mobile Clinic had a great week. They got an opportunity to lead seven other people to Christ. So, you know, we have continued. Thank you for your tithes and your offering, and we are so thankful. Let me say a warm welcome to our guests, whether you're in the room or online. We are so thankful that you're joining us. Those that have not come back yet, if you're online, please share that. We have thousands that watch us and uh, partake of our service, so if you'll do that. But if you're a guest, you want to mo more know, yeah, I talk. Uh, if you want to know more about Bellevue, just simply text the word GUEST 
402-901-9901. We'll be glad to send you some information. Now, it's a big week coming up. It's a big day today. The one thing that we want to make sure that you all do is pray. So you be in prayer for us as we head to Easter, but there's a lot that's wrapped around Easter. We want you to take a moment and view the video of what's going on next week. Easter is next week. On April 3rd and 4th, we'll be offering several services in which you can come and worship. They will be at 5 and 7 p.m. Saturday night and 9 and 11 a.m. Sunday morning. During each of these four services, Kid You Worship will be provided for children four years old through third grade. And it will be a time featuring exciting biblical dramas, live animals, and a resurrection celebration. For those of you with kids three years old and younger, free childcare will be available with check-in taking place in the East Lobby. Then in addition, there will be a sunrise service at the Crosses on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. And be sure to bring your blankets or lawn chairs so you can be comfortable during the service. We look forward to celebrating our risen Savior with you. There's still time to pick up your Easter cross. Stop by Bellevue South, East, or West entrances any day to pick up a cross which you can display in your front yard as a great opportunity to witness to neighbors and begin having gospel conversations. Also, visit one of our lobbies and pick up a packet of Easter invitation cards. We encourage you to use these cards as a great, easy way to invite your family, friends, or anyone you meet between now and Easter to come to church and possibly hear the gospel for the first time. And don't forget to wear your Easter best for a free professional photo with your family or friends. Photo booths will be open 30 minutes before and after each service, except our sunrise service. So make sure to come early and be ready to smile. For more information about these and other opportunities, visit Bellevue.org. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in just a moment, we'll look at verse 21. Would you stand, please, as we read the Word of God? I love this time of year more than any other time of year. I love Palm Sunday, and I love Easter Sunday. And I want to say to you that people will come to church on Easter when they won't come any other time. They'll come to Easter services even more quickly than they would to a Christmas service. And so I want to encourage you. We have little packets of invite cards. They're all around the sanctuary. Please pick up one of those. And this week, go out of your way to invite people to come to church. And I promise you, some of them will come and some of them will be saved. We're going to talk today as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about the miracle of Jesus' death. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is one of the most beautiful texts in all the Bible. Probably one of the earliest scriptures I ever memorized. Maybe the first one that I memorized after I started living for the Lord was verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, new things have come. If you just read all the way down to verse 21, here's where you come to. This is the text we're going to look at today. He, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's all read it together off the screen so we'll all be reading the same thing if that's okay. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Aren't you grateful that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can be robed in the righteousness of Jesus? And when we stand before the Lord, he will not see us. He will see the righteousness of his son. And he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't know if he's talking to us or if he's talking to his son who clothes us with his righteousness. But I can tell you this, if you don't have that covering, you can receive it today by repenting of your sins, 
believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave, and you receive him in your life by praying and just believing that Jesus did all that and receiving him in your life, calling on his name. If you will do that, the moment you do, you will be clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm about ready to preach, but they're going to sing some more, okay? But we're, we're going to uh, have the Lord's Supper. You be prepared for that. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Remain standing, and we'll continue to worship the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that when we survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, Lord, that you would love people like us. Lord, at our very core, we are sinful. But at your very core, you are perfectly righteous. You don't need us, but we need you. Oh, how we need you, Jesus. We need your shed blood to forgive all of our sins. We need your righteousness to clothe us. We give you glory and praise today as we celebrate your cross, your blood, your righteousness. We humbly pray in that name above all name. Let's say his name together, Jesus. All God's people said, amen. amen. These hymns might be old, but the truth is fresh today.
Thank you, Lord. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me again to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Thank you, Brother Wallace. Thank you so much. Haven't we been blessed this morning with this wonderful worship music? Let's thank them again for leading us. Amen. The most important part, the essentials of the gospel, happen to be what we're talking about this week and next week. The death of Jesus and also the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus is still in the grave, we have nothing to celebrate. But if he is alive, which he is, we have everything to celebrate. And if it were not for his atoning death, there would be no bodily resurrection. These go together like a hand in glove. And I want to talk to you today about his death. And then at the end of this sermon, we will participate in the Lord's Supper. Let me take just a moment. If you did not receive one of these little, uh, whatever you call it here, a cup and a piece of bread, raise your hand so that we can get you one very quickly. If you're saved and you know the Lord, we've got one right here on the front row. Uh, can we get those to them as quickly as possible? Uh, just keep your hand up. Let me give you a word of advice. Open the bread first. All right? <laughs> I didn't last night, okay? And so I was holding that thing on there, trying to get the bread off. So if you don't understand, just look at it. And even if you're from Texas A&M, you'll figure it out after a while, all right? <laughs> yeah, all right. That's an old Texas joke. Forgive me. I don't know where that came from. But anyway, all right. it wasn't from the Lord, was it? All right. Look again at our text, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. If you are saved right now, don't ever let the devil tell you anything else. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That's who you are. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at the miracle of Jesus' death. First of all, Jesus' death was miraculous because it was a sovereign death. It was planned before the creation of the universe. The Bible says in this verse, He, God the Father, made Him, that is God the Son, Jesus. It was always God's will for Jesus to die on the cross. From time immemorial, God knew that man would sin. That does not mean that God foreordained men to sin, nor did God cause man to sin, but rather in his omniscience, he knew what Adam and Eve would do in the garden before they did it. Thus, he already had his son in line, ready to go. He knew that man would need a savior. And before man sinned in the garden, God sovereignly planned for his son Jesus to die on the hill called Calvary and pay the penalty for our sin. I like to say it this way, before sin was in man's heart, salvation was in God's heart. God is a sovereign God that knows the beginning, knows the end from the beginning. 
And that's why John the Baptist referred, or John rather, uh, the brother of James referred to Jesus as the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. God knew that man would sin. Even before man existed, it was always God's will for Jesus to die on the cross. Some people say, well, why was Jesus born? Well, it was not just to start some religion. It was not just to give us a body of teachings. Jesus was born primarily to die on the cross. That was the primary purpose of his birth. He was born to die an atoning death for all of us on the cross. I heard someone say years ago, across the cradle of Bethlehem lay the shadow of Golgotha's cross. The Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he ascended back to heaven, sent his Holy Spirit to his praying church who had been in a 10-day prayer meeting. You know, nowadays we pray for 10 minutes and expect for God to show up. God will show up, but sometimes it might take 10 days. Are we willing? Are we hungry enough for the presence of God that we would pray for 10 days? Well, they did, and on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the others were filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. And you know, one thing about Peter is, once he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he never denied Jesus again. The Bible says that he preached the first gospel sermon after Jesus was ascended to heaven on the day of Pentecost. And in that sermon, we read it in those famous words in Acts chapter 2, after the church had been filled with the Spirit and the crowd had gathered, he preached to them and he talked about the fact that God's saving grace was in his predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of my Almighty God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, men of Israel, this is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God, with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know this man, here it is now, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus was sacrificed on that cross by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You used the Romans to put him on there, but I want you to know it was not your idea, the Jewish people. It was not even the Romans' idea to crucify Jesus. It was God's idea. It was the foreordained, predetermined foreknowledge of Almighty God. From eternity past, God sovereignly predestined that Jesus die on the cross because he knew that man would sin. So we focus today as we partake of the Lord's Supper on the fact that Jesus' death is miraculous in that it is a sovereign death. It was a crucial part of God's predetermined salvation plan. Before we disobeyed the laws of God, God devised a sacred plan through the cross to secure our salvation for all eternity. The hymn writer says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my, what? Sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Oh, praise his name, that from time immemorial, Jesus was predestined to die on the cross so that you and I could be sin. What a saving Savior we have. What a sovereign gift is our salvation. It's a miracle because it's a sovereign death. Secondly, it's a miracle because it's a sacred death. A sacred death. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, look back at 2 
Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him, the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin. Say those four words with me, please. Who knew no sin. Oh, the sacredness of the one who was sacrificed. Oh, the holiness, the complete sinlessness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was and is the sinless Son of God. With all due respect, Joseph was not sinless. With all due respect, Mary certainly was not without sin. Oh, but Jesus was born 100% absolutely sin-free. This theme runs throughout the Bible. Isaiah 53, verse 9. His grave was assigned. This is predicting what would happen with Jesus six or 700 years before he was born. His grave was assigned with wicked men. There he died between two thieves. You remember that. Yet he was with a rich man in his death. Joseph allowed him to be buried in his tomb. He was a wealthy man because what? He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Jesus had never committed a sin, and he never would. And Isaiah prophesied that. Jesus, one day, while he was debating the religious leaders of the Jews, challenged any one of them to point out any sin that he had ever committed. Not a person in this room could stand the full light of day when it comes to sin. Every one of us is a sinner. I am, you are, oh, but Jesus is not. And he said in John 8, 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? And they could not point out one failure in his character. Why? He's the sinless son of God. Later on, when a pagan Roman soldier who had been part of nailing Jesus to the cross, when Jesus breathed his last after crying out to tell us die, it is finished, and then, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. As soon as he did that, he gave up his spirit and he died. No one killed Jesus. He gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. And this Roman soldier looked up and talked about the sinlessness of Christ. Luke 23, 47 says, when the centurion, that is the commander of 100 Roman soldiers, saw what had happened, he began praising God. Think about that. This old crusty soldier takes his hat off probably and starts praising God, his helmet, and he said, certainly this man was innocent. The word innocent means sinless. On and on I could go. Hebrews 4.25, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. When I was a youth minister, I can remember one of our 17-year-old boys praying. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He was praying. He was struggling with one of the things that uh, some things that uh, a 17-year-old boy struggled with, and he said, Lord Jesus, you know what we're going through down here. You were 17 once. That's some of the best theology I've ever heard in my life. Aren't you glad that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses? The Bible says, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, but don't stop there. Look at those last three words, yet without sin. Say that with me. Yet without sin. Hebrews 7, 26, for it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, here it is now, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 22, who committed, Jesus committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. And John said in 1 John 3, 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus' death on the cross was sacred because he was the sinless Son of God. May I just say this to you? I don't know of any 
Muslim that would say that Muhammad was sinless. I don't know any Buddhist that would say that Buddha was sinless. But every Bible-believing Christian can say Jesus was totally without sin. He is the sacred sacrifice that was offered on our behalf. You know, he was tempted. Did you know that? We read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. We see three different temptations because there are three categories of temptation. We read about them in 1 John. Do not love this world nor the things of this world for all that's in the world. Here it is now. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the three categories of sin. You can't think of any other category of sin than those three. And they are the exact places where the devil attacked Jesus in the wilderness. First one is this. He said, Jesus, have a selfish ministry. Look at verse 3. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God. Now, what's he doing there? He's questioning the Word of God. Why? Because Jesus had just been baptized. What did the Father say at his baptism? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And the devil comes along and tries to get Jesus to doubt that he is Son. I got news for you. The devil is the first liberal theologian who gets you to try to doubt the Word of God. Liberal theology is nothing but doubting the Scriptures, and the devil was the first to do it back in the garden. Do you remember what he said to Adam and Eve? He said to them, hath God really said? Did God really tell you not to partake of that fruit of that tree? Has God really, God's lying to you. And today, the devil is still saying, do you really believe that marriage is only a man and a woman? Do you really believe that a baby is conceived and that is when they become a human being within the womb? Oh, don't believe that. Just believe science. I got news for you, friend. I'm going to believe God. I'm not going to be a liberal. I'm not going to reject the scriptures no matter the cost. And Jesus was being tempted by the devil. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And Jesus said, well, let's talk about this devil. Let's have a sit down. No, he did not. He knew how that went with Adam and Eve. All he did was stick the devil with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Bible says, he replied, Quoting Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, he answered and said, it is written. Let's all say that together. It is written. That's how you talk to the devil. You quote scripture. That's it. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil says, okay, I failed there. My temptation for him to have a selfish ministry won't work. So let's tempt him to have a spectacular ministry. Put on a show. A lot of churches into this nowadays. Look at verses 5, 6, and, and 6. It says, Then the devil took Jesus into the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. He's quoting from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan quoted Scripture. Satan comes to church. You can come to church and you can quote Scripture and still die and go to hell. The devil knows Scripture. He perverts it, but he knows it. And the devil comes to church. That's not enough. You've got to be in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil does not love Jesus. He hates Jesus. And he hates you because Jesus is in you. The Bible says, he quoted scripture, but Jesus said, oh, you're not going to get me there. No way. I'm not going to go for a spectacular showy ministry. No way. I'm not going to jump off of 
uh, uh, the temple and let my father send an angel and carry me down and get some crowd. No, I, I'm not a showman. I'm not putting on a show. This is not some circus here. No, no, no. On the other hand, verse 7, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay. The devil said he's not going to be selfish. He's not going to be spectacular. Let's see if he'll take a shortcut. He tempts him in verse 8. In Matthew chapter 4, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. That's the evil world system and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. That's what the devil wants. He wants your worship. There might be somebody here today. You're a devil worshiper. I got news for you. He's not worth worshiping. He's not worth worshiping. And let me say this to you. If you are a devil worshiper, I want to say this to you. One of these days, the devil is going to bow before Jesus and say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. So Jesus was like Popeye. He had as all as he could stand. He couldn't stand no more. And he said, now I'm tired of this. Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Interestingly, all three of his responses came either from Deuteronomy, two of them came from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and one of them came from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And that was the time when the people of God were in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And Jesus is now in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And he quotes the scripture that worked back then, and it still works. Amen? The word of God still works. And the Bible says, then the devil left him. He had no option. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Jesus was tempted, but he never, ever sinned. Look upon Jesus, sinless is he. Father, impute his life unto me, my life of scarlet, my sin and woe. Cover with his life, I'll be whiter than snow. Aren't you grateful today that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf? Aren't you grateful that Jesus was tempted, but he never yielded? He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. That's the bottom line, the sinless Son of God. Oh, what a sacred death it was. And then Jesus' death was miraculous because it was a substitutionary death. Now we're at the heart of it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf to be sin on our behalf. Jesus died as a substitutionary sacrifice for your sins. He paid your sin debt. Jesus bore the penalty, not of his sin, he had no sin, but of your sin on the cross. He died for the sins of everyone. First John 2 verse 2 nails it and says, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. I was talking to a man one day, a PhD professor of theology who believed that Jesus only died for the elect. And I quoted 1 John 2, 2 to him. I said, how do you explain this? How do you look at this? He's the atoning sacrifice the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And he said, that's the hardest verse in the Bible for me. I said, oh no, it's the most glorious verse in the Bible. It's at least one of them. That anybody can be saved. Jesus died for everybody the same. And anybody has the opportunity to be saved. Jesus died on our behalf. Oh, it's a miracle he was our substitute, and he died for you and for me. I can walk up to a stranger and say, Jesus died for you, and know that I'm telling the truth. Jesus died 
for everyone. Everyone won't be saved, but everybody and anybody can be saved because Jesus died on the cross for everybody. And some of you might feel like you're too vile of a sinner for Jesus to save you. I got news for you, friend. Jesus can forgive any sin that's out there. Any sin you've ever committed, it is still within the realm of being forgiven by the powerful blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when Jesus' blood covers you, you're forgiven. I read a story about something that happened in Nairobi, Kenya, September of 2013. I vaguely remember this. But four Al-Qaeda operatives went into a mall in Nairobi and opened fire, killing 67 people. Over 200 were injured. There was a young lady there, a mother, Sneha is her first name. I can't pronounce her last name, I'm sorry. I could say something, but it wouldn't even be close, all right? And she was in the mall having coffee with a friend when the gunfire began. She dropped under the table when she heard the gunshots. She was terrified. And she noticed that there was a man lying right beside her and his cell phone was going off. So she said, you know what? I need to silence that cell phone so that the gunners won't come over here and be attracted to that cell phone. And so she took his cell phone and turned it off. When we, she reached into the man's pocket to get the cell phone, she felt the blood that was from the wound that he had suffered from, from the shot of one of the gunmen. And she had this idea. This man was at the point of death. It was obvious there's nothing she could do for him. But she literally took her hand and plunged it into that puddle of blood and smeared it all over herself so that when the people came by to see if anyone was alive, they would believe that she was dead. So she covered herself in this man's blood and she lived. I want to say this to you. When I was 18 years old, I begged the Lord Jesus Christ one night in a little country church to save my soul. I said, Lord, I don't know if I'm saved or not. How many of you have ever been like that? You don't know if you're saved or not. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm going to find out. People say, when did you get saved? I'm going to say, well, I'm going to find out when I get to heaven. Now, that may bother some of y'all. I might have gotten saved when I was seven. Maybe I did. I, I know that I tried to live for the Lord. I never got mentored, whatever you want to call it, discipled. But when I was 18, I was tired of wondering. So I gave my heart to Jesus. You know what he did? I, I couldn't see it. But I can see it in my mind's eye. He covered me with his blood. He washed away all my sins. He forgave me. He washed me. And in his eyes, you may not like what you see, but when he sees me, I'm whiter than snow. I'm whiter than snow. My sins have been washed away by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was guilty with nothing left to say. They were coming to take me away. But then a voice from heaven was heard that said, let him go. Take me instead. Those rusty nails, that spear deep in his side, all that pain, it should have been mine. That crown of thorns was meant for you and for me. Oh, but he took that and he'll let us go free. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on that cross in disgrace. Oh, but hallelujah, Jesus, God's son, took my place. Oh, praise his name that he who knew no sin bore my sin in his body. Jesus died 
for me. I got other things I could talk about on this, but I'll press on to the last point. Oh, Jesus' miraculous death as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, how we praise him for that, how we praise him that it's miraculous because it's a sovereign death. God planned it from the foundation of the world. It's a sacred death. It involves one who was sinless, Jesus, dying for all of us who are sinners, how sacred he is. And it's a substitutionary death. He died in our place. But there's another reason that Jesus' death was miraculous. It is a saving death. Now let's put it all together. He, God the Father, made him Jesus who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Here it is now. Read it out loud, good and strong with me, starting with the word so. Read it with me, please. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus died for you and for me so that we could receive his righteousness. Now, why is that such a big deal? Because our so-called righteousness is not good enough to get us into a relationship with God and in eternity to get us into heaven. You're the best, look, look at me. I heard somebody say this, this is the way I like to think about it. The best five minutes you will ever live in your life is not good enough to get you in good with God. The best split second, if you will, that you ever live is not good enough. You will never measure up because God requires perfection. And with all due respect, none of us reach that level. Nobody, nobody except Jesus. Our righteousness is like rotten rags before God. Isaiah said it in Isaiah 64, verse 6. We are all infected. We are impure, not with COVID, but with sin. You can wear a mask all you want to, and sin will still get in. Amen? When the, we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. I can't even say from the pulpit what filthy rags refers to. Go look it up. You'll find out. Like autumn leaves, we wither and we fall and our sins sweep us away like the wind. When Isaiah, who said those, wrote those words, when he saw God on his throne, he was smitten with conviction. He said in Isaiah 6, 5, I said, woe is me, I'm ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he saw God in all of his holiness, then he could see himself in all of his sinfulness. Some of you are out there thinking right now, I'm not that bad, I, I don't do these bad, vile things. I don't know what you're talking about. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. The very reason that you don't think you're a sinner is why you are a sinner. It's worse than you think. You're selfish, you're focused on what you want, and many times you don't even see that as a sin. But I'm not just talking about how great of a sinner you and I are. I'm talking about the greatness of our Savior today. And I'm grateful that when he saves us, he gives us the righteousness of Jesus. Romans 10, verse 10, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in, say it out loud, righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The moment I looked up to the Lord as an 18-year-old boy and said, God, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I know that I'm having a hard time. But I want you, Jesus. I didn't even see it. But he came in that little country church and put a robe of righteousness on me. And it wasn't just righteousness, it was his righteousness. And one of these days, I'm gonna stand before God, give an account for my life. But I'm so grateful that he's gonna see, not me, not my rags, but he's gonna see the righteousness of his son 
And again, I say, when he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, it is very possible that he's not talking to us. It may be that he's just bragging on his son. Oh, Jesus, here's another one you saved. Well done, God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I believe Jesus is the only good and faithful servant. Amen? Now, if I just messed up a really good thought for you, I'm sorry. But I know this. Whatever it is, I'm going to be clothed in his righteousness. I can't stand before the eyes of a holy God if I'm not clothed in his righteousness. I'm going to ask you, are you clothed in your rags or are you clothed in his righteousness? One of the two. You're either in the rags of the best you can do, which is not good enough, or you're clothed in his righteousness. Oh, to be clothed in his righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I will wholly lean on Jesus' name. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Now listen, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking Sand. The greatest miracle in the world is not for somebody to be healed physically. The greatest miracle in the world is not for somebody to be set free from some sinful stronghold. The greatest miracle in the world is not for somebody to be raised from the dead. The greatest miracle in the world is when someone repents of their sin Believe savingly in Jesus, and God clothes them with the perfect righteousness of his son. That is the greatest miracle in the world. Has that miracle ever happened to you? Are you clothed in the righteousness of Jesus? Or are you going to say, well, I just believe if I do more good than bad, I'll get in. That is not the way it works. And besides, I wouldn't want to bet on that, would you? <laughs> Friend, I want to tell you something. It's not about what you do. It's about what he has already done. He made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Could we bow just for a moment? If you don't know the Lord, would you just receive him right now? Would you receive Jesus right now? Would you open up your life? Would you let him clothe you in his righteousness right now? Pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, my so-called righteousness is like filthy rags. Oh, how I want your righteousness, Lord. I repent, I turn from my sin. Lord, I can't promise that I'll never sin again. But I turn from my sin. I ask you to forgive my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. And I believe that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And I believe you rose from the dead and you're alive. I believe what the preacher is preaching about. I want your righteousness. So I call on your name. Save me right now, Jesus. Clothe me in your righteousness so that when I stand before God one day, I will stand clothed in the perfect righteousness of my Savior. Thank you, Lord. Now with your heads bowed, as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul, speaking about the Lord's Supper, says, 
beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Don't take the Lord's Supper lightly. It is a spiritual checkup. And I want to say this to you. Examine yourself right now and just ask God, is there any sin in my life that I'm unwilling to repent of? Is there any sin in my life, dear God, that I can't think about, that I, I don't know? I need you to draw it to my mind, Lord. Is there anything going on that I need to confess and forsake? And I want to say this to you. If you have any sin in your life that you will not give to God, that you will not repent of, do not take the Lord's Supper. I'm not saying if you've ever committed a sin, don't take the Lord's Supper. I am saying, though, if you're living in sin and you won't repent, do not take the Lord's Supper. It, you'd be better off not to take it. If you continue to read there, some people got sick and even died because they wouldn't repent of their sin, and they went ahead and took the Lord's Supper anyway. This is not for sinless people, but it is for repentant people. It is for broken people. It is for those who call upon the Lord, not only for salvation, but also for cleansing. So would you do that right now? Let's just take a moment. I'm going to be quiet for just a couple of minutes. And you just say, Lord, I'm not sinless, but I can repent of sin. And I don't want any sin in my life before I receive the Lord's Supper. Let's take a moment. Examine yourself. Don't examine anybody else, just yourself. Father, we thank you for your presence here as we partake of the bread, as we partake of the cup. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This bread represents the broken body of Jesus on the cross. Take and eat. Now open the part that has the juice in it. Think about the blood that Jesus shed on the cross when you look at this to forgive you for all of your sins. Take and drink. And what we want you to do is don't 
set these down. We've got garbage cans outside and nobody is going to be able to clean up after you, okay? We've got other people coming in. But I, I just hope that you'll take this out and throw it away. Let's all stand, please. If you want to set it down just for a second, but make sure you pick it back up. If you don't know the Lord, would you come to him today? I want our singers to come. We're going to sing one more praise song, thanking the Lord for the cross. And while we're singing this, I want our pastors to come. And we would just love to lead you to receive Christ. If you've already done that, we would love to help you grow in grace and move on to the next step. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to join the church, whatever it might be. Come and we'll talk about that. Maybe you just need prayer. Come and we'll pray with you. This is a house of prayer. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, you come. If you're in the balcony, boy, we got a lot in the balcony. Let's thank, wow, look at all the people in the balcony. Great job up there, super. All you guys on this side, you'll go right over there with he's got his hands up. I, I can't tell who they are because they've got masks on, all right? That's the, the guy right over there. And then all you guys on this side, you'll go right over here. And uh, all the guys on the floor here, you'll come forward. If you want to join the church, if you want just to talk with somebody, get saved, get baptized, whatever, you come. I'm going to pray. We'll sing. Please come. Father, we love you and we thank you that you're a living God. Jesus, you're in this room. Help us to run to the throne room. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come? Come to the Lord. Let's all sing.
tell these folks maybe watching online if you got saved watching online or if you got saved here today text the word Jesus to the number 901-901 and we will follow up with you it's very important that you do that if you're a new babe in Christ you need some care so let us help you get started in the right way Every one of us ought to get one of those packets of invite cards and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And this week when we're out and about, we can just say, hey, I don't know if you've got any place to go to church this Sunday on Easter, but we'd be so honored to have you at Bellevue. And then just hand them that little card. It's got all the information. You don't need to say anything else. You can say whatever you want to. But just say, we've got five different services you can come to this coming weekend. Oh, I wish you'd come. And they said, well, I don't know anybody. They said, well, I'll come. I'll be, be glad to meet you if you just want to meet me at one of the doors. And y'all can work that out, you know. I'm telling you, what if somebody got saved? And then they wound up marrying somebody that was also saved. And then their kids all get saved. And then their grandkids get saved. And then guess what? One little invite. One little invitation. One little card. You never know what God will do with that seed. So I'm asking you. These things don't do any good sitting out here in these bowls. Get a bunch of them and pass them out. If you've not put a cross in your yard yet, still have some outside, please put them out and make sure that people see the cross of Christ. Thank you for being here today. And remember now, this is not the mission field. <laughs> You're about to walk out into the mission field, all right? And this is where we huddle up at the beginning of the week to dedicate our week to God and to dedicate ourselves to God. So let's do that right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we go, let us go as ambassadors for Jesus Christ, royal ambassadors, dear God, children of the King, and help us to represent you well, and help us to invite people to Christ and also to church. Lord, help us to invite people this week to our Easter services next weekend. And I pray that many people will be touched, that you would give us divine appointments. Lord, that you would just lead us to the right people and that we will know in our heart to give that invitation card to those people and to say a kind word and just to be nice, dear God, in a world that is so full of meanness and hate. Oh God, let us just be loving and kind and point people to Jesus. Thank you for being with us today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great Lord's Day. Thank you for being here.